Hi everyone, uh, I'm Ahmed from ACM. Uh, it's been a long day, so we talked about Agile a lot today. And uh, I want to start my uh, presentation with a fun video first. Maybe you have seen it, it's a very popular video in Turkey nowadays. And we put some subtitles to make it uh, fun in the software development world. Let's see. This was uh, fun for us also, and uh, we had a great time while we were preparing the video. So um, I want to talk about management in Asia. Yeah, it's, it's Hi, this is Teresa Bennett. I'm the analyst coach. <laughs> <laughs> is Still videos. Advanced skills, so they're being recruited into more senior level positions, and I also help uh, people. They have recorded the question. So uh, when we say management and agile, they look uh, a bit like an oxymoron. Yeah, it's it's true. But uh, there's there's management agile, of course, but not the type of management that we. Do. So I want to talk about that a little bit, and uh, I want to mention some important th things that, are, that I find value in uh, the distinction between traditional management and uh, modern management. So I, I'm going to start with the ACM first. So I will go through the slides a little bit first. First, myself. Uh, I'm the co-founder and managing partner of ACM uh, and one of the co-founders of uh, Asia Turkey as well. It's the biggest organization in Turkey right now. 
Uh, we had a summit last year, and attendance was uh, around 550 people. It was a big one. And uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Agile Middle East. Uh, and thanks to Faris this, for this organization, he, he had great effort for organizing the event and for everyone who is involved in it also. And I am a, a certified trainer and enterprise transformation consultant from Scandador. Scandador is a Boston-based company and they are providing certifications. Uh, Ken Schreiber, uh, one of the co-founders of Scum Framework, has uh, founded the company. Uh, who is ACM? If we look at ACM, we have eight years of experience and success uh, in, in our field. And uh, we've been giving agility services from the first day that we have founded. So all of our services are under uh, agile umbrella, we can say. We have this much of uh, training, consultancy, and so on. It's, it's, it's a great amount of, we are helping companies to, to be more agile with, with some services like consultancy, training, and outsourcing. So we are currently pioneer and the leader in our region. If we take Turkey as the basis, we're doing services in Greece, in Azerbaijan, in Russia, and in Saudi Arabia. And uh, we have we have uh, we have uh, a big team of consultants, which is also one of the biggest, which makes us also one of the biggest consultants companies in the uh, East Europe. So we are, we are supporting many, uh, all the local uh, Asia communities, like Asia Greece, Asia Africa, Asia Bosnia, Asia Middle East. And also uh, we are working with the worldwide known uh, Asia communities, like Scrum the Dog, Scaled Asia, Scrum Alliance, Asia Alliance, APL, and Version 1. We have partnerships with all of these uh, companies and organizations. So we have three main uh, areas of consult uh, services, consultancy training and outsourcing. I will go fast. So consultancy, we are doing agile transformation support by coaching and by monitoring the process, by making it transparent. We are doing software re-engineering and redesign, redesign services. So when you want to deliver fast, we cut the quality very quickly and our systems become uh, like spaghetti systems. So we need to find a way to make them healthier. So software engineering service uh, actually aims to uh, increase the health of your systems. On the other hand, on consultancy side, we have three main areas of consultancy, coaching, agile studio and agility checkup. In coaching, our coaches go to your teams and they support their agility transformations, the mindset change by giving hands-on support. And uh, the Agile Studio, Brock also told about it, it's the Scrum Master of the organization and it helps the company to transform like a real Scrum Master. And also Scrum Masters are working in that studio. It's an autonomous unit inside the organization. Furthermore, we have regular checkups. We are trying to monitor your health. So we are working with many companies in this manner. On the training part, we are working with Scrum and Scrum Alliance. We are providing their trainings, like professional Scrum Foundations, Scrum Master, Product Owner, uh, professional Scrum Developer. And we are providing Kanban services. We are going providing safe uh, trainings, uh, scaling Scrum trainings, management 3.0 trainings, and also trainings for uh, agile engineering practices. So we have a wide range of trainings in this manner. And also outsourcing, uh, we give outsourcing services to companies. Uh, we can do turnkey projects contracts, but even if we do turnkey contracts, we still deliver continuously and sometimes someone from our team joins to the agile teams 
to uh, bring expertise and bring manpower. So, this is, uh, and these are our customers. We have a lot of customers right now, and we are trying to increase uh, the number of our customers. We are trying to increase the quality that we give to our customers, by the way. So it's a hard job. This is the core uh, ACM team who are providing services. We also have the outsourcing team. We are about currently now 30 people. Not such a big company, but uh, if, we, if we look at the, uh, as I said, agile consultancy companies, they are like one people, two people, five people. So we have a very structured way of transforming the companies and we can collect these great people all together. So, we talk, we talk about Agile a lot and uh, we say that changes, uh, the world is changing very rapidly. And uh, what are the parameters that are changing when we look at the parameters? People are changing, necessities, market technologies, tools and media, and behaviors, organizations, methodologies, they are becoming old very quickly and the requirements. These are the things that are changing. Actually, everything is changing. Once the Heraclitus said, uh, everything endures but change, but it's faster than ever right now. Here are the mass use of inventions, mass adoption of inventions. When you look at the telephone, it took a hundred years when we look at the internet, it's like 15 years to adopt by some uh, certain number of people. So Tom DeMarca Timot and Timothy Lister also made a research and they came up with this result. What they're saying is this is the average life cycle of the products. And uh, in 1984, it was 20 years. When we come down to 2004, seven years. What might it be right now? What is the average life of lifetime of products right now? What do you think? Three? One year. Two years, yeah. It's two years. Let's take the average of three and one and it's two years. So everything is changing. Products are changing. So when, when you look at the cars, they had models like BMW had models like uh, 3 and 5, but now they have series like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, every kind of series, right? So uh, the companies are trying to diverge, not just, they just don't want to do what they, uh, what they are doing uh, more efficiently. That means the cost economy is almost over. So we are going into an economy which needs innovation a lot. So, uh, we have to adapt to this changing world. If you don't adapt, you will be lost. You will know it. And uh, actually, there is one thing, one thing important, one more thing important about the change also. If there is change somewhere, there are risks, right? And also, what else do we have when there is change? If there is change somewhere, there are risks. If something is changing, what else do we have? Why? Why is agility so important? Yeah, there are opportunities also. So agility is actually important to get the most out of uh, change. If there is change somewhere, you, have, you, you, you can create value from that change, actually. We usually look at change as a risk. Oh, it's changing, so we have to adapt it. No, it's changing and there's an opportunity. We have to catch it right now. If we don't, and if we don't uh, catch those opportunities and we cannot sustain it, then we will die, of course. So. So the only way to survive is adapting to change. And it's, yeah, it's easy to say that you have to adapt to change. But of course, we need things to do to become 
an agile organization to, to, to become agile. So, uh, and there is also a new generation that you have to manage if you're working in a company as an executive or in the management level. We had generation X, we had generation Y, you know the generations thing. So X generation was like more into command and control. So you say something to an X generation person, he doesn't question that thing. He says, okay, I'll do it. I'll try my best. But when you're working with the Y generation, what do those guys say? And you say, do something. They ask, why? Why do I do that? What's the reason behind it? So we need to also motivate those people. We need to create a collective ownership while talking about management also. So here is the Asian Manifesto that came in 2001 by uh, 17 software groups and who came together at Snowbird Ski Camp to talk about what to do better. They came with this manifesto. What is it saying on the right side? What do we see? What is the right side saying? With one word, one or two words, let's say, what's the summary? It's progress, right? It's tools, actually. Documentation is a tool. Negotiation, contract, contracts are tools. Plans are tools, right? And tools are tools, right? So the right side are the tools. The left side are the purposes, actually. What do we aim when we look at the agile industry? We can see the goal right away. So we want to deliver software working so. We need customer collaboration. In at the beginning of the 19th, uh, 20th century, we need we we were in a position that the workers should be working harder, right? They they should be working harder, and they should be uh, producing what they are producing in the cheapest way to have higher profits. But now it's not the way. Now we need to uh, come up with new ideas and we need to turn these new ideas into product increments very fast. We're not really thinking about efficiency that much at this point. So, we're on the left side. We have to go on the left side. And when we look at from a project management perspective, what do we have here? So, visibility in a waterfall project. Think about the visibility in a waterfall project. So you come, come together with the customer at the beginning of the project and you ask the question, what do you need? He gives us an answer, right? He says, I need this and this and that. We force the customer to think what they, what they really need at that moment. So they're in a position that they are under the pressure of telling more things. And they tell us things that they will never use, as the guy said and loud. So, and we expect the good ideas, best ideas occur at the beginning of the process. But good ideas occur during the process. When you see something, you imagine the better, right? So we make the plan and we say, Okay, we got your requirements and we are going to deliver you what you want six months later or a year later. So did we really ask the uh, necessary question here? We are going to deliver something one year later to the customer and we got all of the requirements right now. What is the right question for this kind of a situation? What do you What will you need one year later? This should be the question, actually. What we ask is, what do you need right now and we are going to deliver it one year later? A year later, many of those features will be meaningless and our systems will be full of unused features. We all know it. So, and we got the requirements. We want to our 
rooms uh, in which there is no sunlight. Okay, we go to our rooms, we start developing, and somewhere here, if you grab someone on the corridor at the corridor and ask, "How is how is your project coming along?" What would be the answer? Thank you, Jim. The answer is fine, right? Fine, it's okay. Do you have do does he have any idea about how the project is going? Just fine. It's like you're asking him a question like, "How are you?" And he says, "Fine." He has no idea. Or somewhere here, if the project's uh, budget is finished, what's going to happen? What do you have in your hand? What do we have? Nothing. Nothing, right? Uh, at the end of each iteration, they deliver an increment of working software or working product. So when you ask the question here to an agility, how is your project coming along? What is the answer? It's easy, right? It's going like this. I know how it's going, because working software is the basic measure of how the project is going for us. So when you look at, this is, this is actually uh, something very related to risk management, right, in agile. How do you manage it? We always have working software. Even if we lose our budget, what do we have? We still have something to deliver, something to develop, right? something to create value. So this is why we call this kind of methodologies or uh, this kind of uh, approaches as value-driven development. We don't like plan-driven development anymore because plans are true, Plan plans may, may change but our focus is on delivering value. And when you look at the risk, in a waterfall project, you come to the end of the project, and when the visibility increases, you can say, we have to, uh, we have to uh, extend the deadline at the end of the project, right? You cannot say that at the beginning, because visibility is very low. So when you look at the business value delivery, how you, how do you manage business value at this manner? Still, look at the area here. You have a lot of business area. There's a logarithmic curve, but still, we are always working on the, the important stuff and always delivering that important, valuable software. So, this is one aspect for us. So, we, we, manage, the, uh, we manage the risk, we manage the adaptability, we manage visibility in a much better way. And here is, a, here is another uh, survey about how the world is changing. This is the IBM CEO Challenge Survey. And uh, they asked the CEOs what their two primary challenges are. And they said uh, in 2004, sustainable growth and adaptation to changing demand was their two primary challenges. When we come to 2010, there are more CEOs here from different countries. They say managing complexity and being innovative. Where is this complexity coming from? What's happening? Why did they say first adaptation to changing demand and then it became managing complexity? So it speeds up, right? It speeds up, speeds up. And we have sources of complexity when we think about software development, we have requirements, we have technology, right? And different than construction, we have people. Yeah, in construction we have people, okay? But the uh, effect of a person in a project is much higher in software development, right? If uh, one day someone from the, a person goes from the team and someone switches, does it change change the uh, plans in a software environment, software development environment? It changes, right? You have to change your plans if someone changes. You cannot just say, okay, we have a new person and plans are still remaining the same. So the effect of people is too much because you don't have sand, iron, you don't have trucks like you have in, uh, in 
construction. You have the person and the computer. That's it. You don't have so many things to uh, play with. So people are a very important point in agile software development. So this is why we focus mainly on the people, mainly on the teams, because they are the one. If you can motivate them in a right way, then they will be a lot more productive. So in this environment, uh, we define the Scrum's DNA as uh, with, with two uh, main concepts. One of them is empiricism and the other one is self-organization. You know what empiricism is? Everyone knows, right? Empiricism. It's trial and error. Iterative incremental software development uh, also comes with this bonus, right? You can try and you can see you, you're failing, you're failing fast, then you try something else. It's, the, it's very easy. What is self-organization? What do we understand when we say self-organization? What does a self-organizing team do? Within software development team. Within software development team, Means yes. Allowing professionals to, to test their professionalism in the way they want. Yeah, For the exactly. truth, you, you are the test. So I, I'm the test in, I don't know, database something. Mm -hmm. I'll choose that part. Okay. So the part will be mine. And the other one will be yours. Mm -hmm. something else. Let's, let's take the discussion a little bit further. Self-organization uh, organization, uh, usually is being used with self-management. When we say self-management, what do we get from it? Empowering yourself. You get it right? Sorry? Empowering oneself. Yeah, exactly. There is empowerment. So we give the responsibilities and the accountabilities, not just responsibility, the accountabilities of the managers some of them, to the teams, right? So sometimes uh, well self-organizing scrum teams can hire and fire people. You know it, right? You don't need a manager to hire and fire people. We can talk about the budget, but hiring and firing can be a team's job. So self-organization is in the heart of agility, actually, because Taylor, has created this concept, scientific management, at the beginning of the uh, uh, 20th century. And he said, thinkers and doers should be separate concepts. There should be thinkers and doers. And we create a great gap between the thinkers and the doers. We create that process. But now, when you look at the world, everything is changing fast. So thinkers and doers are the same people, many times. So this is why we are way leaner. This is why organizations are uh, cutting their flats. They are uh, trying to become flat, right? So these are all the ingredients of self-organization. So have you heard about Zappos? They are using a management framework called Holocracy. They don't have uh, roles, they don't have job titles, and they are governing their company once a month. And once you are working on this project this month, next month you can be doing something else, like you can be doing sales, right? So they, they are hiring highly skilled individuals into their companies, like entrepreneurs. And actually they call it intrapreneurs. So everybody is in management and everybody is also in execution. This is how it goes, actually. So, uh, in a scrum team, product owner is a manager, management position, right? So what does product owners manage? Back of product. The product back of right? Does he manage the team? No. No team management, no people management. We don't have any people management in scrum. Development team, what does the development team manage? Features, maybe take tasks. Features? Software features, or the way that they are going to uh, yeah, implement those features, the how part. Actually, we call the product owner as the person who is responsible from doing the right thing, and the development team is responsible from doing it right. So, development team manages the sprints, actually, from a high perspective. 
They manage the sprints. No one can tell the team what to do and how to do it. Just we give guidance and a well self-organizing team requires help. They say, okay, we have a problem here. You're stuck in here, so we need help. Right? And what does Scrum Master manage? Logistics, right? What else? The Scrum process itself. He is responsible from the Scrum process. And if there are impediments that are causing the team, prevents the team being productive and functional, this is the Scrum Master's responsibility. So is there any role like saying this one manages this one or this one manages this one? There are no uh, management relationship between the roles. So each role manages its own work. Right? And each one of them fulfills a uh, certain amount of responsibility. So this is how it works in Scrum. This is how self-organization occurs in Scrum, actually. So uh, we say in, in our uh, work lives, we say that there is democracy many times, right? So when you say a good democracy, we have the separation of powers, like right? legislation, execution, and judgment. In traditional management era, a manager has all the accountabilities about the person you, who is the person that he is managing, he or she is managing, right? He has all of these responsibilities about this person. So is it democracy then? We are going to a workspace, workplace, and then there is a manager there, and he is the king of you. He, he has all of these uh, powers. So in Scrum, we divide these powers. Who is on the legislation part? Who? Scrum master. Oh, Scrum master. Product. 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 Yeah. Product. And who is on the execution part? Who is accountable? The development. The development. Exactly. And development part is Scrum master. In an ideal Scrum team, which role don't we need? Scrum master, right? We don't need the Scrum master. Because it's like, think about it like the police, or think about it like the uh, judges. In an ideal country, if everything is going uh, in the right way, we don't need the judges or policies or cops. And the less we have those uh, forces, the better uh, we go. What else? Maybe we are not doing Scrum the right way. Or we, we think that we have self-organization. But there is a Scrum master over there, and he is forcing people to answer those three questions. Who is responsible for uh, doing the daily, daily standards? The development team. The development team actually uh, creates an environment where there is a peer pressure. Not manager pressure, not process pressure, that's peer pressure. So you're responsible for the things that you do to your teammates, no one else. So the Scrum Master isn't uh, required in that meeting also, but he needs to make sure that the team is at daily standard. And we're talking about servant leadership concept. What does servant leadership mean? Servant leadership. It's the opposite of like command and control. It's the opposite of that. Yeah. So we're basically leading from the ground. It's not like commanding somebody, helping them to achieve something. Yeah. That's right. right. Or and you're giving uh, the, the command to the people who are actually doing it. The person? No, the team. The team. Yeah. Empowering the team. Yeah, exactly. And probably the team. And also, it's, it's something like this. The team, a good team, can choose their scrum master, right? And sometimes we choose our politicians. In our country, we choose our politicians. And we expect them to be servant leaders. But they don't. Right? We all know it. They start serving themselves. Right? They stop serving us, and they start serving themselves. And you know what, it's, it's something 
culture, actually. In our country, we call the place where the uh, president of the USA living as the White Palace. We don't call it White House. They call it White House. But we say, in, in Turkish, we say it's like White Palace because he should live in palaces, right? And uh, in our country, again, uh, many of the societies call the place where there is judgmental things like court of justice or house of justice, but we call it again palace of justice. Okay? There should be a palace that judges. So this concept is again a little bit cultural. But so we have internet, we have this speed of change, so it's going to change. So the world is colliding. So it was a challenge 10 years ago for us, but now it looks it doesn't look like a challenge anymore. So servant leadership is a very important concept in Scrum, in today's management, actually. So sometimes if you have a manager, you can lead your manager also, right? You can make leadership to your manager. He manages things, then you lead the conversations, lead the technology, and so on. So leadership is about the intellectual power of the individual. So we, we are switching from uh, role-based, from character power-based, uh, source of power-based uh, approaches to intellectual power-based approaches. Where does the Scrum Master's intellectual power is coming from? How does the Scrum Master lead? With what? He knows Scrum, right? He knows how to manage crucial conversations. He knows sociology. He knows team spirit. He knows about quality. He knows about the importance of quality. How it damages long-term productivity, right? And he influences the team to do better. He, he can motivate the team with all of these aspects. So it's a real important concept. And here, we see the structure of the organizations. As I said, the companies are going leaner nowadays. And when you look at those companies, like they have sales operations, IT, marketing, HR departments, or you can just take the IT, and they have analysis, design, coding, testing departments. So we have, again, the same vertical structure. So where is the value is being uh, created? Is value created here? Is value created here? No, right? The value is created here, actually. If those uh, nodes can collaborate, then you create the value. This is why we need organizations that can collaborate easily. And sometimes we need to change the structure of the organizations in this manner. So what we tell the companies that we go is, we need to take management in three levels. At the topmost level, we have a strategic management, this portfolio or program level. Who is dealing with those things? Who is dealing with the budgets? Executives, right? Executives, portfolio managers, the PMO, high-level PMO, and things like that. And then we have product, pro uh, project, and service backlog management, which is aligned with the objectives that are decided at the top level. Then we have here the mid-level management. And then we have another level of management too, which is task management. Who is managing it? The teams are doing the task management. We usually see managers that are assigning tasks to individuals, actually, which is completely wrong, which kills transparency. Right? So, an organization structure can be like this, as you see here. You can take people from different parts of the organizations to create value circles, create value teams that can easily and quickly create value in the organization. They are like small startups, as you see, because startups are fast, and they create. They can create value very quickly. This is how actually Scrum name first came from.